Welcome to episode 7 of the Beyond the Guitar podcast, where we help you play the music you love, and we talk all things guitar and beyond. I'm Nathan Mills, joined by my co-host, Jeremiah Diaz, and today we thought it would be really interesting to talk about the creative process, and specifically the creative process as it differs between composing original music and making covers um, or arrangements. Um, of course, most of what I do with Beyond the Guitar is is making covers and arrangements, and most of what Jeremiah does is composing originals um, in a variety of genres. He is quite the Renaissance man of late, it would seem. Is, is that, isn't that right, <laughs> Jeremiah? Uh, well... I've never done any uh, Renaissance style pieces of music, so I don't know if that if that fits very well. No, but you got you, you got what do you you got like indie indie folk, you got like lo-fi, you got ambient now, you got soundtrack orchestral stuff, piano stuff. I mean, I I could go I could yeah. go on and on. Dark electronica as well. Oh, that, yeah, uh, whatever that is. Yeah, I've got too many projects that's why no one knows who i am <laughs> you're just uh, i'm not focused enough to you're put out consistent you're stuff. eclectic <laughs> eclectic is the term yeah it's true um oh. but yeah i i think it's um i think it would be really interesting to kind of unpack the maybe where there are parallels in the process between composing and, and arranging and um what similar hurdles we face, um, as well as, of course, the differences. Um, so, I, I I wanted to ask you because, especially, I feel like with composing and songwriting, everybody's process is different. Um, so, I know there's not going to be like a universal answer for this for everybody, but I'm curious for you specifically, Jeremiah. Do you generally sit down with the intention to start composing something from scratch? Like you've got a block of time. You're like, all right, I'm going to compose something. Or do you generally wait for an idea to spark as like a jumping off point for, for when you're going to start composing? Or you kind of have, maybe you have a running list of different ideas that when you get a chance to compose, you're just going to start taking one of those and running with it or how does that usually start off for you? Yeah, I think I mentioned this uh, in one of the first podcasts. Uh, but basically, for me, um, the, the the way that I usually approach composing something new is thinking about it first. So if wh whenever I try to sit down and write something without having any thought beforehand, like I mean, I might have like a basic idea of what style I want to go for or something. Um, but usually that doesn't really, uh, work. Like I end up getting stuck for some reason. Um, most of the time, I mean, I, I'm sure there's been times where that hasn't been the case, but 90% of the time I usually think of something in my head and I'm like, I want to go for this. And I, I kind of want it to sound like, you know, I want the synths to sound this way. I want the, the structure to be like this. And then, um, from there I usually sit down and, and play with the idea. Uh, and I don't know why that is, but yeah, it's for me, it's hard to find inspiration without really thinking about it first. And um, it's annoying. <laughs> well, and when you say thinking about it, yeah, well, well that, I mean, that is tough. And we'll, we can, that's definitely something that we can dive into is like with, especially with arranging versus composing, like, you know, composing, you really do have to, uh, create that inspiration in many ways, whereas arranging, you know, there is that source material. But so when you're saying you have to kind of think about it beforehand, what does that look like? I mean, is that, does it tend for you like just randomly throughout the day, like some idea might hit you and you kind of jot it down or record something or, or, or um, what does that look like when you think of it beforehand? Yeah, um, I, I might, uh, you know, I might just be like watching a TV show or movie or something and I might have an idea for something or I'll be listening this to 
uh, an artist that I really like, and then I'll be like, oh, that's that's kind of cool. I I could I could do something similar, but you know, uh, different, but do it this way. And then I might in my head riff off of that, and then I would get go to my computer and start uh, putting things together. Um, and then with uh, like like I'll I'll mention like guitar. Um, there are times where I'll pick up the guitar and I'll have an idea in my head of what I would like to play, and I'll have to kind of figure out what notes to play. Um, but that has worked for me in the past. I'm just not a very good guitarist, but, um, uh, so usually I'll get like my phone or something and, uh, record it on, on my phone real quick. And then I'll save it for later. Um, that or like ukulele or something like my, my son loves ukulele. So, um, I'll grab his ukulele and mess around with it and might come up with some ideas. So, um, yeah, usually it's, it's just kind of a, uh, a weird thing where, I'll, it, I'm in my head a lot and I might even be like having a conversation with somebody and then like I'll start like drifting off into like my own thought process right. and I'd be like oh that that mu- what if I do this musically or whatever and then uh and then I'll try and get to my computer and put it down but um yeah it's it's weird like I said I wish I could just sit down to my computer and like you know on my keyboard or whatever and just like be like oh I thought of this on the spot um but I I'm not really that way unfortunately like, like for example, the the like the Mad Max Fury Road thing, right? Uh, that I did, uh, the the little piece that I did. Um, so that, like, I w- I had an idea in my head. I knew what inspiration I was going for, and I knew what things well, I knew what things uh, were supposed to sound like. And I wanted like horns, but like horns that sounded like crazy. And I wanted electric guitar and crazy percussion. And I just kind of went went from there. So it's not always like it's not always like I have an exact melody or an exact chord progression in my head. Usually it's kind of like, I want it, I want it to give me this impression. I want it to give me this uh, feeling when I listen to it. That's more what it is. Right. So it can just start from something as simple as like the, the instrumentation and the kind of atmosphere and vibe that you want to go for. And then yeah, exactly. build from there. Um, yeah. So to me as an arranger, I feel like it would definitely be easier to get inspiration from something that's already existing and then, you know, maybe composing something original from that rather than just having this completely blank canvas. That's what always has intimidated me about composing um, with a little bit of composing that I've done, just that completely blank canvas just starting from scratch is uh, is always really intimidating for me. And with with arranging, that's one one reason I love that is because I don't know. Maybe I'm not <laughs> I'm not creative enough to just start from that blank canvas. But so for, with arranging, I feel like it, it's this perfect middle ground for me because it gives me an opportunity to be creative and to have a voice. But I have that source material that is the inspiration. I mean, and that, that everything I'm, I'm doing is obviously based off of that. Um, so that hurdle, that initial hurdle isn't there when you're arranging versus composing. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you, cause I mean, I know that you did do one original piece of music for your patrons a while back, um, called even glow. And, uh, you know, I, I think you got positive feedback from most people, but obviously it's hard to get people to listen from scratch, like with no background at all to these new pieces that you, uh, you, you might make. So I was going to ask like, what w- is there, is there anything down the line that you're like looking towards? Like I might want to make my own music eventually or for now, are you just kind of like good with just doing the arranging because of the, both the, like the, the monetary and the, uh, the intimidation factor. Yeah, actually I get asked that a lot like you know when are you going to start composing your own music as if it's uh i think a lot of people assume that that's always the end goal um i mean i i I think arranging it's kind of like cover bands and cover artists and arranging can sometimes have a little bit of a stigma um to where like if you're not composing your own music you're not a real musician I know you're thinking it, Jeremiah, so you can just come out and say it, all right? Well, no, 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 I've never said that. <laughs> no. I just, you know, I legitimately remember uh, 
being in high school together and like writing music together was always really fun. Yeah. And obviously I was, you were the more talented guitarist and uh, I always enjoyed seeing you go through a process of like writing something. I mean, obviously we've talked about this, but the music that we made back then was not anything to uh, write home about. But um, I, I, I would be excited for the idea of you making your own stuff and not because like, I think that it's a stepping stone that you need to, right, right, like, right. otherwise you're not legitimate, you know, whatever classical guitars, but I think it would be cool because I think that you do have a lot of creative uh, and cool ideas, at least, at least when we were younger, you did. And I would assume that those things are, uh, it's like a better like a now. Fine they're just, just kind of untapped. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, yeah, I'm interested in doing it in the future. Um, but honestly, like, so for me, like arranging isn't a gateway um, to composing. Like a lot of people uh, who who are trying to make a career for themselves in music, they do start as cover artists and then pivot to composing their original stuff once they've built up that that audience because like we've talked about, it's a little, it's, it's easier to get people to care about what you're doing when it's music that they already have history with. Yeah. And so you build that audience of people that care about what you're doing and then they're more likely to care about your original stuff. Um, so like that one original composition I did, even glow, um, it's available on Spotify. If anybody wants to go, you know, listen to it and Apple music and all that stuff. But I didn't do like a music video for it or anything because I knew this was also kind of earlier in my YouTube days. I just knew most people just weren't really going to be interested in, in watching it. So I just never did anything with it, uh, video wise. Um, but it was, a, it, yeah, it was a cool learning experience. Um, you know, I think it's halfway decent, but, um, I, I just genuinely love arranging. Um, I think it would be really cool to do like, you know, compose guitar stuff, like tracks for, you know, film or TV or, or video games, not being like the end all be all composer, but yeah. you know, if they needed to contract out like, you know, a guitar track or something like that, I, I think stuff like that would be cool to do on occasion. But, um, you know, again, arranging just for me is that perfect middle ground where I do, I get that creative itch where I can take something and, and make it my own in a way and add my own personality and my own creative choices to how I'm going to arrange it and interpret it. Um, but I don't have to just <laughs> create something totally from scratch. Um, I think one of the biggest things for me, um, one of the, the, the biggest hurdles when, when composing is I always feel like, and I think this is for everybody. I always feel like I'm going to subconsciously rip off of something. <laughs> like I, when I, when I am sitting there or with, whether it's when an idea has struck, cause I used to, I did compose like a lot more, even back in college, um, I would mess around with, with little things here or there. And I would do like, I, I would have like a running log of just quick videos. I would shoot on my phone, kind of like what you were talking about. Anytime an idea would hit, I would shoot a quick video of me playing it. So I wouldn't forget it. And then half the time that it never really evolved into anything complete. So I had all these random little snippets of potential tunes. Um, but I would always wonder like, is this, have I heard, like, is this, yeah. Something I've heard and yeah. I've forgotten that I've heard like, or is this, you know, close to something like my subconscious, I'm subconsciously ripping off of something that I've heard somebody do. And that's why it hit me like that. It was already somewhere tucked in my brain. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's, that always, I'm like neurotic about that. Yeah. And that, that's, that's a really hard part about composition. Um, because, well, especially if you're on a single instrument, like I think instrumentation adds a whole nother level uh, and, and like adds layers to a composition to where you might be playing, like if you play three notes on a piano versus three notes in a, in a band or an orchestra or whatever, they're going to sound totally different. So like even there, there's a, 
there's a way for you to get a to kind of differentiate from whatever music you might right. potentially sound like. But um, yeah, that that's that's a really daunting part about composing for me as well. Is like, oh man, I like this chord progression. It's like, oh, but has anybody else used this chord progression before? And then chances are, right? Yeah, yeah because definitely. there's there's only so many chord progressions that you can have, unfortunately. But I mean, the awesome thing about music too is that um, there is literally like an infinite number of like harmonies and melodies you can come up with, but it's just a matter of, I mean, at that point you start, you start getting into music theory because usually if you're trying to come up with something really unique, you're going to have to uh, be out. You're going to have to use notes that are outside of just like a major scale or a minor scale. You're going to have to use accident accidentals. You're going to have to change keys. You're going to have to do things like that. So that that's where it starts to get more complicated, but yeah, it's uh, it's definitely something that's uh, scary. Like you're gonna rip some rip off right. somebody unintentionally. Somebody's gonna come come at you like, hey man, that that's from this song. And <laughs> yeah. Like oh man, I never even well, heard that and, song. And before. I think I that that, that finite nature of music is also what what really intimidates me with the composing process. Where it 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 works two two ways. Like you said, it, it it's crazy how given how finite music is. Um, so we've got 12 notes essentially that we can work with. Right. And, and then those, those just repeat. Yeah. And then out of those 12 notes, you know, like you said, we can use, we can get creative with the scales and the modes that we're using and, um, you know, borrow chords and harmonies from other keys and things like that to, to try to be more creative. Um, but there's also, if you are in a certain genre, you know, there are certain sounds and chord progressions and, and scales that are generally like our, our ears are trained to like them. Um, and so, you know, so out of those 12 notes, lots of times you're not going to be able to use as, as you know, all, it's not like you can use all 12 in like a, yeah, like a twelve tone indie folk <laughs> tune, right? Like it just doesn't work. You mean um, Schoenberg? So, Schoenberg didn't have a an indie <laughs> band back in the day, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, so it also kind of depends on the the genre, but the nature of like when I was like, man, I've got there's like twelve notes. There's a limited amount of like chord progressions that um, will work for specific genres. Um, that felt very limiting to me. But again, when you're a good composer. Um, you know how to get creative with that. And, and that's the really cool thing is that be, even though there's the finite nature of music and we've got these 12 notes, the fact that to this day we are still hearing music that's different and fresh. That's, that's always blows my mind. Yeah. I don't understand how, how we have the amount of music that we do that is unique. Um, and even when you start studying like other cultures, like in college, I, uh, we had to study like Indian music and they have like microtones and like the scale going up is different than the scale going down. And it's right. like crazy. They, uh, there's like a whole nother world. There's all kinds of different worlds out there. Um, and then on the other hand, it's, it, it's cool how universal music is because like a lot of ancient cultures also like use the pentatonic scale. And if you listen to like to, you know, kind of stereotypical like music from Asia or something, it sounds sounds has a certain sound and it's like pentatonic scale. But then like uh, Native Americans use pentatonic scale as well, and like all kinds of other cultures use pentatonic scale. So it's 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 interesting. Yeah, Celtic music lots of times. Does, yeah, and then and then we've got of course blues. Yeah, like. and stylistically they all sound completely different. Right. So it's crazy how you know that's that's just five notes. Five right? notes, yeah. So it's like yeah, it's 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 crazy how that how that works. Um yeah, I going back to like having that subconscious so I mean inspiration I feel like unless you live in a bubble, inspiration is never totally original. Um because we're constantly being influenced by what we've heard you know, everything that we've heard up to this point in our lives is going to somehow influence our, our, our choices. Um, and so 
I always felt that like when I was trying to compose stuff, I wanted to get, I, I wanted to get in the mode where I like wasn't listening to music for a while to try to counteract that. Um, but that's can be counterproductive too, because again, sometimes that inspiration will strike when you are listening to something else, but I'd be really interested to hear like, it would be crazy if, I mean, maybe there are, maybe there's been some kind of nutty study done like this, (laughs) but I think it'd be super interesting to hear people compose music that were like, that like grew up in a, like, like a lab and they never heard other music before. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and like hear what they would come up with they were just taught they were just taught theory and told to make stuff or even i don't know not even taught theory but just like somebody just plopped a you know guitar right down in front of them and and you know didn't even tell them what it was you know to like <laughs> hear what they would i mean maybe they would just like think it's a weapon and like i don't know try to bash people with it or something but um I don't know, like that, that's the only way you're going to get truly original music (laughs) at this point. It's like living in a bubble, literally. Yeah. So we talked about um, writer's block and like how to, how to get through that a few episodes ago briefly. Um, I imagine... I'm curious if that's different for, so I talked about how I push through it with arrangements in the sense that because there's already, you know, uh, the, the music and it's whatever original form is already exists. And I'm just trying to translate it in a way that is creative and works on the guitar specifically. And so if I'm stuck and I'm having a hard time, coming up with a, a version that I'm happy with in any given section, um, I will just force myself as an exercise to just try something, you know, whatever, however garbage it turns out, um, I'm going to put something on paper and then I'm going to scratch that, go back to the drawing board and try that same section, but use a different technique. So I'll take that same melody that already exists and that same chord progression that already exists. And maybe I'll try it with harmonics um, or I'll try it with tremolo or some, throw some arpeggios in and, and then keep doing that until some type of something connects and something starts to click. So how do you deal with writer's block for your own original compositions? For me, usually it, um, involve, I mean, it, it's not only this, but it usually involves finding tones that I like because in electronic music, at least for me, the, the, the style that I like to go for, um, I like to make sure that my synths sound, I mean, not always, but I like them to sound somewhat organic. And then also that, that goes, uh, with, with the, any drum tracks or anything that go in there. So a lot of times what will happen is like, I won't be able to find or make the sound that I, that I have in my head and it like, won't sound good enough. Yeah. You know, it'll be like, Oh, this, this sounds like a drum, like a drum machine or this sounds like, and, and some people intentionally want their electronic music to sound that way. And that's fine. But, um, that's usually where I get writer's block. I mean, and then obviously like, you know, trying to find, um, you know, a chord progression or melody, whatever. Um, but usually what, the initial block for me is the just is just the tones themselves. Um, so what a lot of times what I'll do is uh, it, when I find something I really like, I'll save that patch and then I'll like use that in other tracks. But then I'll I'll tweak it so that it sounds different for each each um, song. Um, but I'll it, whenever I land on something, I'm like, oh, I'm I'm saving this for later because I I want to be able to get, like if I want to start a new song, I'll I'll go to the back to that and you know, use it. But one thing I wanted to mention also, uh, back to what we were talking about regarding being afraid of ripping off of someone else's music. Um, I used to be afraid of that a lot more than I am now. Um, because I've realized that so many different artists like borrow or use, uh, chord progressions or like, you know, certain styles. Um, and what I've found is that I just hope that 
if it does sound like something else that I put my own spin on it. Right. And it, uh, and again, with instrumentation and, and stuff, it can, it can get to a point where it sounds so different that people won't even notice. But as far as, uh, as far as writer's block for me, definitely it's, it's the finding the right tones that I like that that's kind of, that's kind of my block usually. Right. And it takes a long time. It takes a long time for me to get happy with something. Yeah. I, cause that's, that's a whole, I feel like that's a whole other angle with, with the more electronic music side of things where not only, not only are you trying to create original sounding, you know, melodies and chord progressions, but you want, yeah, the tones that you produce too, you want to have, again, it could take inspiration from other artists and stuff like that, but the tones that you're producing, you also want to, you know, have your own voice and your own sound with those. Yeah, and with like collaborations, like what we did together for the the podcast intro, you sent you wrote the guitar track and then sent it to me, and I was like, okay, I need to I need to add something to this that sounds like it fits with what Nathan wrote, um, both stylistically and just uh, aesthetically. Um, so that took a while, just finding the right drum sounds. Um, there's like a little synth, like kind of. Korg slash Rhodes esque little uh, keys in the background, and then there's the piano. Um, so yeah, there, there there was a lot that went into that to to make sure that this all timbrely that that all fit together. How 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 do you approach writing that track? Because you knew that I was going to be adding stuff to it. How how was that working on a collaboration? Yeah, I guess. Well, and I guess that's the that's the first. Uh, composition that i've done in a long time too i've probably since even glow so <laughs> i mean it's you know it's a simple little tune but um yeah and we and we went for something simple for, for the for the purpose yeah. of the serving right well i think that with that we had it was kind of all about the the communication up front we had talked about going for this kind of lo-fi vibe and ever since ever since you were really starting to dive into lo-fi, I started listening to it more and um, getting more familiar with, I don't know, I guess some of the trends that you, you hear in that style. And, and we had talked about um, like a lot of the lo-fi genre is similar to like, you know, Eric Satie's Gymnopedie, like where it's that yeah. two <laughs> chord, like a really simple chord progression, like two chords back and forth. And, um, so even just having that simple framework to, to jump off from, start there and kind of, you know, I just experimented with different chord progressions. I'm, I'm a, a sucker for, uh, just drop D and like, uh, that certain like D major chord voicing and drop D. And so I was, that was kind of my, one of my first go-tos to, to play around with that. And, um, and so, yeah, it kind of went from there and just those two chords back and forth. And I wanted to, because we wanted also, we wanted that to be not too busy, like not too much going on since it's just the intro to the, the podcast. We didn't want it to be anything that, um, it would be something memorable and, um, it would help kind of brand the podcast, but it wasn't supposed to be totally in your face, you know? Yeah. And so we went back and forth on that too, a few different iterations of busier melodies. Yeah, tempo. Yeah, and, like I had yeah. one version <laughs> where the melody was I was doing a lot more little flourishes and hammer-ons and pull-offs and stuff and it was a little bit too busy and so we reeled back from that. Yeah, we did a lot of back and forth on the the tempo where I like did it slow and then you told me to do yeah. it fast and then you told me to do it slow again or something like that. <laughs> like yeah, and then and then and then the the final version that you sent me, I ended up uh, manually kind of stretching out, but it sounded cool because uh, it it, uh, it adds to the lo-fi aesthetic with little repeats and stuff, especially in the little bridges or whatever the the little uh, minor sections. Mm-hmm. Um, I chopped up the audio to make it sound like things were skipping. Or, you know, it's it's, yeah, a, it's yeah. very standard standard thing that a lot of that you'll find in a lot of hip hop and, and lo-fi music, but um, it just adds another dimension to the music. Cause it's like, this could be just two simple chords, 
but instead you add all these different elements to it and it, it all of a sudden sounds way different than if it were if it was just the, the plain old recording and that's what i love about electronic music is that there's so much you can do with it but um yeah it was really fun working on that collaboration with you and hopefully we can do more yeah yeah that that's actually going to come out that track is going to come out on on spotify and all the other platforms on uh june 5th um in fact we already had uh somebody like covered it on instagram uh, a couple weeks ago they they were playing it on guitar which was really cool oh yeah i saw that i was gonna ask you so 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 going back to arranging um you've mentioned there's there's been a few um like tracks or, or a few pieces of music that you've put off um, arranging because you've been kind of afraid to not do them justice. And I'm just curious if you ever like listen, because going back to like being worried about copying people, do you ever go and like kind of look at what other guitarists have done or is it like, no, you don't want to do that. You want to just, you know, come up with something as original as you can. Right. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. Um, I, so again, all, all going into that, that fear of, of not wanting to subconsciously rip off of something. I think I have to be extra cautious with arranging because obviously, you know, everything's a rip off, right? <laughs> Cause I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm making a, uh, you know, I'm, I'm taking something, uh, the, the source material and just readapting it. Um, you don't want to be, you don't want to be accused of being a ripoff of a ripoff. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So like if, if we are, and there's, especially since there's certain, certain things are going to work better on the guitar. Like when in my like arranging courses, I teach about like certain keys just naturally, fit the guitar better right so if the original song that i'm working on arranging is in some key that just does not translate well to the guitar i'll transpose it into this different key and that sets up the framework for my arrangement and so if i listen as i'm working on that arrangement i listen to somebody else's arrangement and it happens to be in the same key that i chose there's bound to be parallels because it's the same source material, the same key. Um, and so then if I listen to that, I'm either a gonna end up ripping off of some of their ideas or B just being such a, like uh, such a wreck for the whole process, like second guessing, like, well, I can't do that because they did that. And right, <laughs> so exactly. like, yeah. if I don't, if I don't listen to them, Um, I guess it's more for my own peace of mind because chances are, you know, they might've chosen the same key. I'll I'll go back lots of times and listen to some of my colleagues arrangements of the same tune after I have finished mine. And, you know, it's, it's, it's actually really cool to hear two people arranging the same tune because lots of times, um, you do get two very different results, which goes to show how, you know, arranging really is a creative process. Um, but if there are parallels after the fact, I can at least have that peace of mind knowing like, Hey, like it just happened. It was a coincidence that we both made that same decision there. Um, yeah, but I didn't, you know, it it wasn't like, I won't have that doubt of, (laughs) of whether I did it, you know, subconsciously or not or whatever. Yeah. Um, it is funny though. One time, uh, we've talked about my buddy, Sam Griffin. Um, I, I had seen, I don't remember if I'd even seen that he put this out. So we, we both ended up doing the, um, evil Morty theme from Rick and Morty. Yeah. Rick and Morty. I was going to bring this up. Yeah. (laughs) And so I intentionally did not watch his video for that very reason. Right. I didn't want to accidentally rip anything off. Um, so I put the video up at the time I did like, I was still kind of sometimes doing some like costumes and stuff like that to keep things, uh, interesting. And so I did the evil Morty characters, like a yellow t-shirt, a black eye patch. And sometimes back then I was also doing just like a black backdrop for my videos. And, um, I go back and watch Sam's video after I was done with mine and I saw... (laughs) 
He had his yellow t-shirt on. He had the black eye patch. He put up a black backdrop as well. So like in his video, of course, was out a little bit before mine. So it really did. Our versions did thankfully sound different, um, which was cool. <laughs> but the aesthetic of the video was identical. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I got a little bit of heat uh, from some of his boys on that one. Um, <laughs> I remember so, <laughs> I remember you having but, to like, uh, explain to people like, ha ha, yeah, it was total coincidence. Like I didn't even see his video. Yeah, it yeah. Just sounds, it just sounds like you're totally like just trying to cover for your, right. <laughs> for, for your ripping off. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but uh, people know that, that uh, Sam and sam and i are are buds yeah but yeah i did i like pinned a comment saying like (laughs) before anybody accuses me of anything um which like you said (laughs) yeah probably made me sound more suspicious um but no yeah i'm i am very cautious about not listening to other people's arrangements before i before i do mine but then i do love to go back and and listen to them after for that reason that i was talking about where it's cool to hear the different the different choices that we made. Yeah. That's, that's probably the smartest, smartest way to approach it. And I I did have one other question because you mentioned changing keys uh, that fit for the guitar. I noticed that some, some of your videos you'll use a capo. So like, I think of like, uh, uh, ancient stones from Skyrim or like stranger things, Mm -hmm. uh, you'll use a capo, but for other arrangements, you just change the key. So when, when does that, come into play what when when you're when are you like oh i'm gonna use a capo for this yeah so um usually if i'll use if i use a capo it's because so changing the key is always the what key i end up choosing um the priority is always based on how natural it's going to feel on the guitar so i will um i'll play around with some of the main melodies and chord progressions or whatever kind of the main theme of the tune that i'm working on arranging i'll take it i'll figure it out um in kind of a a rough version and i will experiment with it in different keys that i know work well on the guitar because you have to take it on a case-by-case basis um and then whichever whichever one of those options fits um, the theme and the guitar, um, I'll, I'll just roll with that. Regardless of, I don't I don't care if it's in the same key as the original. Basically, like that's not a priority. Um, some people do like they they feel like they need to stay in the same key as the original. Right. Um, but again, my priority is to make sure that it sounds like it was meant for the guitar. And that comes down to how natural it is to play on the guitar and the key goes into that. So if I use a capo, that's generally um, that's generally just if once I choose a key that works well for the guitar, if it's close enough to the original key that I can just capo it up a little bit to get it to the original key, um, then I'll use a capo and if, if it's still playable and I can still use the full range of the guitar, that's when I'll use the the capo just as like an added bonus to it. Cause you know, if I can get it to the original key, that's, that's nice. It's just not a priority. And lots of times that's not an option because the key that I end up choosing is way different than the original, or I'm using like the full range of the guitar. And so obviously if you use a, a capo, you're losing frets um and the the more you know the higher the capo up on the the fretboard the more frets you lose yeah you just got to get a cutaway classical guitar with uh right yeah (laughs) and get all those super high notes it's one of those bridges that extends into the sound hole you know yeah (laughs) it's just like one of those crazy things yeah this fancy stuff yeah Yeah, those those, those harp guitars right yeah yeah the high (laughs) notes are it's even if you can play them, it's like, it's really hard to get good tone out of those high notes on, on a classical guitar. Yeah. You got to really have that soft, soft touch. (laughs) Um, so I, um, I still, I kind of like to share this. I don't know if this is encouraging for my students or not. (laughs) I kind of thought about that today because I was like, well, maybe it's not actually encouraging, as encouraging as I thought. Um, Because I'll tell my students, usually when I start a new arrangement, I still to this day 
um, get kind of intimidated. Um, it's there's something about kind of the weight of the undertaking of of any new big project where um, uh, you know wanting to do it justice and and knowing the the challenges that I'm going to be facing with it. There's always still this little tinge of intimidation when I first start a project and. Um, I like to share that with my, I like to be transparent about stuff like that. Um, because at, at least in my mind, I feel like it helps people understand that like, it's okay if, if they're feeling kind of a, a little overwhelmed or intimidated undertaking a new piece or a new arrangement or a new composition, like even people who they might look up to in their, in their field, have some of those same feelings. Um, so I just, I always like to be transparent about that. So I wanted to ask, like, do you kind of get some of that same feeling when you're at the beginning of a new composition or is it just like all fun and games or how does that play out for you? Yeah. I mean, um, for new compositions, I think I've, I've mentioned this before, but it's always the, the fear of like failure to come up with something that, I am proud of. And then yeah. when it's something like for a client and this goes for even like sound design and stuff. Um, yeah. I'm always worried that they're going to like be disappointed or they're not going to like it or whatever. And uh, yeah, there's always that fear of failure. Um, so intimidation, I think is always, I think it's healthy too. Like, I mean, it can be unhealthy to, if, if you're let it, uh, what's the word cripple you or, or if it, prevents you from doing you know starting at all uh which i struggle with with original music but when it's a job when it's a gig that i i have to do sound design or i have to compose music for whatever um then usually the intimidation is there but i'm able to work past it i just kind of have to mentally psych myself up for it um but yeah i mean i think i think what i was saying was i think it's i think it's partially healthy because I think it's bad to get complacent or, or, or overconfident because usually I feel like that's yeah, when definitely. that's when things go wrong, and that's just I feel like that's just kind of part of life. Overconfidence is not a good thing. Um, humility is a it's a it's a useful trait. Yeah, I, that's a really good a really good point because I think yeah if you if you're no longer feeling a little bit intimidated, um, then yeah I think you could argue that you just don't really care that much exactly anymore, yeah right like um i think that intimidation comes from like i mentioned that that weight of that responsibility of wanting to do good work and so you're holding yourself to a high standard and uh and so as a result of that you're going to do better work um along those lines i think that is there's definitely a parallel um between arranging and composing that that both are very um they're very vulnerable pursuits and they they force you to take risks um and and like you were saying to kind of to get out of that comfort zone and to push yourself and it's kind of a i mean it's kind of a universal rule in in life in general is that if you're doing things that scare you a little bit or intimidate you a little bit those are the things that are generally going to help you grow and learn. And those are the things that you want to actively seek out. Um, but yeah, I think that's a, a something that as composers and arrangers, we both have to, to deal with uh, that kind of the vulnerable nature of that creative process. So like for, for composing, you know, you're putting out something into the world that is very personal right it's wholly yours um yeah and you know you 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 take on that risk that if people don't like it it's hard to separate yourself from that because i mean it it's yours and so i I've, it's really hard to not take that personally and i still feel that that same way with with arranging because obviously it's my arrangement. It's not my composition, but there's still that ownership because it is my, my own arrangement. And if somebody doesn't like it, then I, I do 
feel, you know, I have that danger of feeling like that reflects on me as well, but there's still some separation because, um, you know, I, I'm not responsible for the source material. So I, you know, I guess I could always argue <laughs> that, well, they just didn't, they just don't like the, you know, the original composition. My arrangement's <laughs> great. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, well, you're even at the point where, I mean, you're, you've come a long way, but now you're at the point where like even the original composers, like a lot of them have seen your stuff. It's, it can be, that can be intimidating too. Like if you write, if you, you know, arrange one of their pieces of music and they see it and they're like, Oh man, this guy's trash or whatever. Um, <laughs> you know, so you want to make sure you do, you do things justice, I guess. Yeah. That's what I was going to say is that I think where, where arranging might not be, there's not quite as big of a, of a pressure in the sense that it's a very, it's not as personal. Um, it does have that added weight of, of responsibility to, to, like you said, do this music justice um, and meet people's expectations, right? Whether it's people who are just fans of that original music or people who, you know, just within your audience who have come to expect a certain level of um, quality from you or even the, the composers, like you said, you know, if they end up seeing it, um, yeah, that's a, that's a big thing for me. And that's where, like you had touched on before, there are some arrangements that I choose not to do <laughs> for that very reason, because I don't think I will be able to do them justice. And it's usually not, you know, that I, I doubt my abilities as an arranger or anything. I mean, usually that comes down to the fact that some things just aren't going to translate as well to just one guitar. It's, right. It just, it's not infallible to where it just works for everything. Um, if you're just creative enough, sometimes things just don't translate well. And, uh, and so, yeah, if I feel like I'm not going to be able to do it justice, then, um, then I'm not going to do it. Yeah. It's too bad, but yeah, it's the way things go can't uh can't do drum covers of orchestral music unfortunately (laughs) (laughs) i can't do you know all all these rap songs you know that i've been just dying to do unless Uh, you're uh, luca uh, luca strickignoli i'm sure you can 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 do some stuff (laughs) hip-hop has a lot of uh guitar in it a lot of times yeah the the doing the actual raps themselves is, is oh yeah that's, that's nut that's yeah. nuts to do on the guitar but yeah <laughs> Luca Strickignoli that guy uh, for those of you who are familiar with him if anybody can do it he can but he also has insane guitars like triple neck guitars and things like that <laughs> um, one thing that that I a big difference that I think uh, the the arranging process, compared to composing process is that um, with composing, I know some people's styles differ in the sense that some people will have more of a theory first approach um, or they might not always have a theory first approach, but sometimes maybe that inspiration will come from a theory first approach, meaning they're thinking about um, specific chord progressions or specific keys and uh specific modulations and things like that over um over just like experimenting and and letting kind of just the sound kind of guide you um and so i'll definitely say with arranging it's it's certainly harder to separate the music from the theory because um at least for me because I do have, you know, some, some understanding of, of theory and harmonic analysis and stuff like that, that, that helps guide my arranging process as I'm trying to figure out what chords are happening here while I'm listening to it and, and, uh, and things like that. It's, you're not as wholly just focused on just the music and the sound of it because you, you have to approach it from this analytical, perspective as you're trying to figure out what's going on um so i do feel like sometimes i i like to be able to just 
enjoy music for what it is. And I'm, I've never been one to really geek out on music theory. So with arranging the fact that you can't always separate that, um, sometimes that can be a little bit of a struggle. Yeah. I mean, I definitely have that experience as well with like doing collaborations or with even like remixes or stuff like that, where I, I need to know what key it's in. I need to know what chords are being played. I mean, some, sometimes I can just, you know, kind of figure it out, but it's a lot easier to start out with all that information because then I can, you know, be off and running and add to it right away. Right. Do you, with your own compositions, do you have there ever been times where you, an idea has started more from like a a theory first approach? Um, sometimes I'll like I'll think of a jazz uh, chord progression, you know, like uh, two five one is a very popular yeah. one. But um, yeah, sometimes I'll think of like, oh man, I really want to. I wouldn't really want to incorporate like a sus chord or whatever, or like I right. want, or I, if I'm doing something like in uh, like in the Mad Max Fury Road instance, the, the, the little composition I made for that. Um, I knew that I wanted accidentals in there because um, I wanted to have a lot of dissonance in the music. Um, and uh, so in those cases, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll have ideas in my mind about like, oh, I, I definitely want to use this chord progression or I want to use this set of notes uh, to make sure that I get the effect that I'm going for. Definitely. Right. Yeah. I think the, the sweet spot is where the theory meets the sound that you're going for. Meaning, um, you, the more you understand about theory, you develop this kind of library of, of sounds and you know how to create those sounds. Right. So like you mentioned, like the sus chords, like those have a very specific sound. And so as you're composing, you can fall back on that, that theory knowledge, um, as you're going through and you're like, Oh, I want that specific sound. You know, that's where the theory comes into play because that's how you, you know how to create that, that sound. Yeah. Um, and that, that's what I love about, about jazz chords so much is that, uh, you know, you play it. You play a chord by itself, and it's like, oh man, that sounds terrible. But then you play it within the context of uh, of a song, uh, and, or or like a jazz chord progression, and it's like, oh man, that sounds that actually sounds like relaxing or beautiful or whatever it is. Um, it's it's right. like amazing how you can manipulate uh, these chords or notes in a way that actually sounds the opposite of of what what they sound like by themselves. It's, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah, that's. Uh, the, the first time that that hit me really hard was um, I have a book called Chord Chemistry by Ted Green. And um, it was like the first page and like the introduction where he's really just talking about like just selling you on, you know, why you should go through this book. And he, he did just that where he gave you, he's like, play this chord with this specific voicing and and yeah, you know, by itself, it just sounded really just dissonant and unpleasant. And then he gave uh, a chord progression with these specific voicings that had this very specific and planned out voice leading uh, to where in the context, like you said, that chord all of a sudden like, almost transformed into something totally different. And, um, and, and yeah, that blew my mind. Uh, unfortunately that's like as far as I got in the book <laughs> because the whole rest of the book is literally just page after page after page of, of just, it's, it's more ink than not where it's just wall to wall chord, chord voicings. Um, <laughs> just like a billion different ways to play, you know, an a augmented chord and like all these different, uh, just countless voicings um is just kind of overwhelming but you know it's a good resource um yeah, and, and sure. again it's it's um that's like the extreme of of that concept that we were talking about where you build you start to build this this catalog of of specific sounds that you like and uh and the theory comes into play to know how to to create those yeah well and i know that like like in college you told me before that like you were definitely not into the jazz stuff like you were like 
more along the lines of right. like, classical is my is my niche or, or my wheelhouse, I guess. So I, I had I had I've been curious about your arrangements for things like um, you know even the Star Wars uh, uh, cantina or like uh, Toy Story, like mm-hmm. you got a, you got a friend in me or the Pink Panther. Um, all those yeah. are very very jazzy tunes. So how do you how has that been? Uh, for you compared to like the more quote unquote classical stuff. Yeah. Those definitely don't come as, as natural for sure. Um, and a lot of it relies on a lot more of my ear. Um, whereas because I'm not an authority on jazz harmony, um, you know, I, I, I understand the basics, but I don't claim to by any means, um, understand all the, the super complex jazz harmonies and, and modulations and modes and all this stuff. Um, so when there are a bunch of really complex jazz chords, um, I, I, I definitely have to rely more on my ear to pick out each individual note in the mix that I'm hearing to form that chord. Whereas if it's something that that has a harmonic structure that I'm more used to, um, I can generally infer like what's happening just based off of, um, context and things like that. Like I don't necessarily have to worry about picking out each individual note of the chord. I can kind of use my just understanding of, of the context and, and, and how these chord progressions tend to go, um, to guide me. So yeah, those definitely are, are more of a challenge. And there are also lots of times more of a challenge to, really pour my heart into like, you know, if, because it's a style that isn't as, as, um, dear to me, I have to work harder to, to really, um, enjoy it. Right. Cause I think a lot of, if you're not enjoying what you're playing, that's going to come out in your performance of it. So that's another thing that's really important for me. Um, one thing that I've learned with guitar playing, um, when you are creating the music, there's a whole other side to enjoying the music than, um, than when you are a, just a casual listener. Um, so when you're just listening to the music, you're just, you're focusing on how the music sounds, right. And how it makes you feel on an emotional level. But when you're actually playing the music, there's this physical side of it as well. The physical enjoyment of literally your fingers playing those notes and making those chords. And and a lot of those jazzier tunes, while I don't necessarily like enjoy them as much, like, of course, you've got a friend in me, like Toy Story, um, that has so much nostalgic value for, for me. I, I enjoy it for that reason. Right. Um, but like pink Panther or something like that, I don't really have any horses in that race. Um, and so that was an example of something that, um, I didn't just inherently enjoy, but a lot of those jazzier tunes have such a cool groove that is physically fun to play. Right. Yeah. Um, and so that's where I, I can usually find my enjoyment in the process, both the arranging process and the, the performing of it is you just enjoy the physicality of it. Yeah. De- I mean, I, I can definitely relate to that with, with drums where like I, I might be playing like jamming with someone you know, and when we'll be playing music that I would never listen to, but it's so fun to play that it's, it's enjoyable to play, but listening to it is a totally different story. So yeah, dude, getting your body involved into it's like dancing, you know, um, getting your body involved is definitely something that helps me when I'm playing music that I don't necessarily enjoy, but, uh, right. It's, it's yeah, it's, it's definitely a thing. You've done a good job on the jazz tunes, by the way, that, um, <laughs> <laughs> you, you wouldn't you wouldn't think that you weren't a jazz I, I know you are but you wouldn't think that you weren't uh, uh, you weren't a jazz musician so that's pretty cool oh well thank you so the the big question that I want to ask um, and we might kind of wrap up on this um, is it harder for you to start or to finish <laughs> a composition oh yeah definitely finish 
finishing is yeah. is the hardest thing to do. I just I think I just finished a collaboration that I'm doing with my brother. Um nice. and it's literally been in the works for like over a year. And it's just been one of those things that I've like had to go back to over and over and over and tweak and it goes kind of back to that the whole 80 20 principle what's it called again um yeah the pareto's law yeah, yeah, pareto's yeah. principle yeah um i have just had such a hard time being satisfied with it um but i think i finally am and again this is one thing that i'm really trying to improve and um yeah so anyway um finishing uh original compositions is so hard uh because it, i mean I, pretty much everyone i've ever talked to and even when you listen to like directors talking about the movies they've made like most of the time they just run out of either budget or time and like they just have to put yeah. it out like i think i think the lord of the Ring, the two towers I, I remember watching the special features for that and they were literally uh they were literally editing the like Ents battle like a week before release date or it's, it was something crazy like that. And, and then I think for the desolation of smog also uh, in this special features for that, I think it was literally like the day before they were doing final sound mixing on it. And Peter Jackson's like, okay, yep, that's it. And then they send it off to like the distributors. It's like insane. Yeah. I think I heard that like, yeah, like Peter Jackson for at least one of them, like hadn't actually seen the, the final the cut, final cut <laughs> yeah. of the movie until the the premiere because they yeah. were like just right up to the wire dude it's i mean it's insane like so yeah i mean i think it's a struggle for any kind of artist to just finish something but yeah how, how, what's your take on it yeah yeah i think that's pretty universal both for composing arranging everything i think they i think there are different challenges for starting and finishing, like starting is like everything that we talked about where it's the yeah. uh, just getting that idea and the, the writer's block and things like that. Whereas finishing is more of the, um, like you were saying, the the just the, the nitpicking and the it's the finality of it, like being able to say, OK, it's done. Um, yeah. Or what often happens with people, I see this a lot with my students with arranging as well, is it's like just the, the, the distractions, right? Like you work on one project for long enough and yeah, as you're getting toward the end, it's slowing down and it's, it's not as exciting, right? As this like new, Oh, a new idea hits. Yeah, and then that's yeah. exciting and you want to jump into that. And so then you end up jumping ship and you have all these unfinished projects. And so yeah, I have so many um, unfinished songs. It's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. It's, and so there really is a, there's a discipline and there's an art to finishing things. And, um, and I think there's like, that's why you always see all these like songwriter challenges and things like that on social media where people are challenging, you know, forcing themselves to, uh, you know, start and finish a song, you know, every week or every month or whatever. And yeah, um, like we just did in the Arrangers Academy, we did a monthly challenge where everybody had to start and finish an arrangement. And the rule was that it had to be super simple it could literally only be a melody and a bass line um, and so for some people that was you know almost overly simplistic um, but it forced them to kind of have no excuses but to start and finish something whereas if if the rules are open-ended and you can make it as complex as you want that's when you run into that that whole that nitpicking and fine-tuning and and, uh, and so there's definitely something to be said about training ourselves to, to finish things and being okay with that 80, 20 principle of, of like, of knowing like, Hey, I can, I can nitpick for 80% of my time on this last little 20% yep. of this tune, or I can put my stamp on it, send it out into the world and then go move on to something new. Yeah. Um, yeah, and and it's hard. It's hard because like for me, I, I'm I'm finally starting to put music out, and it's like I want it to sound legit. I want it to sound professional. But um, like you said, most of the time, the stuff that I'm worried about, most people won't even notice. So it's like not even worth the that effort and that you know pain and struggle. <laughs> yeah, 
yeah, I mean, everybody that listens to it is going to think, wow, this sounds professional and this sounds awesome. And like, you know, <laughs> the things that we are nitpicking about are often going to be um, totally missed. And that's, I think, the really important realization too for anybody who is trying to make a career, whether it's composing or arranging, um, those things that we nitpick about um, don't generally push the needle forward in our career, meaning they, they don't, it's hard to say this concretely because I, you know, we are talking about the arts and there is something to be said about that, that pursuit of quote perfection. And, and there is, we do want to really hone our craft and be the best that we can be. But at yeah, the end of sure. the day, we're not serving anybody by us, you know, slaving over this, these last little details to try to make this perfect. Um, if we're doing that at the expense of actually releasing music for people to listen to and enjoy, like who is that actually serving? If I, if I work to try to make this arrangement, the best thing that anybody's ever heard, but it takes me, you know, two years, is that really worth it when I could do 80% of that and put out something, you know, every other week. Yeah. Um, and I, sh- and I should say like with, with the song that I, that I am finally, uh, finishing, it, it wasn't like a, you know, every day I was working on it. A lot of it was me like putting it off because I, again, it's in that intimidation factor of like, uh, like, we, we got off to a really great start initially. It was like, oh, yes, it's like you were saying, it's fresh, it's new. And, and then it's like, oh, I'm losing steam. And there's certain things about this that I don't feel are working. And so I'm just going to put it off. And that was a lot of it, too. It's just like not getting back to it. Um, but that's what I'm working on is like actually starting a project and finishing it and releasing it. So Yeah, we, we sometimes we just need to force deadlines on ourselves. And yeah, deadlines are... So helpful. It's, yeah. I mean, it's all, it's all a mental, it's all a mental game, you yep. know, it's, it's, it's cause it's a vulnerable thing like we talked about. So, um, I think we're all kind of in that, that process and on, on getting better at that and just disciplining ourselves. But, um, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's all I had. Um, cool beans. So if you want to learn how to make your own classical or fingerstyle guitar arrangements like we've been talking about here. Um, I do have a free training on my website, beyondtheguitar.com. It's called Fretboard Freedom, um, where I teach you how to find and play chords anywhere on the fretboard. It's a great way to get started with this. Um, So again, go to my website. You can check that out for free. Uh, If you want to hear my work, you can go to YouTube, Beyond the Guitar. Um, You can also... Uh, follow me social media everywhere is beyond the guitar. Um, we'd love to hear from you on Instagram. If you have ideas for um, future podcast topics, hit me up there. Uh, Jeremiah, where can everybody find you? Um, you can find me online. Uh, just look up Chomachi. I'm on uh, Instagram, uh, YouTube, iTunes, uh, Spotify, all that good stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll be having some new music coming out in the next month or so one of them is a collaboration with uh, Nathan and the other one is a collaboration with my brother Um, so yeah man I'm pretty excited awesome awesome well thank you so much for listening Uh, as always much love and we will see you in the next one 